Hi everybody, welcome back to Life with Aaron. And today, we're in Vicksburg, Mississippi at the beautiful and exquisite Duff Green Mansion. This is a part of old Vicksburg where you still honestly feel like you're in the late 1800s. The architecture, the beautiful homes, the brick and cobblestone roadways, it's truly impressive, and I actually wish we had more time to just spend in the area. But we got one night here, and I want to take you through this beautiful place, one of only four homes in Vicksburg that is recognized by the Smithsonian. This house has been beautifully kept and is taken back to exactly what it looked like pre-Civil War. And one of the reasons that this home survived the Civil War, because many did not, was that it was converted into a hospital. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. If you're looking for an overnight stay, a couple nights, a romantic getaway, the Duff Green Mansion is perfect. We stayed in the little ante room that was on the first floor, and I can honestly say we had a fantastic time. After the Civil War, the home actually changed hands a few times, and it would later be purchased by the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army owned it for 50 years, and then it was converted into a bed and breakfast. Virtually no furnishings whatsoever existed in the house when it was purchased from the Salvation Army, and so the owners have meticulously went to yard sales, went to estate auctions, anywhere that they could find period details whenever possible, they put it back into this beautiful mansion. At the turn of the century, very similar to what occurred in England, it became harder and harder to keep these old homes up. The families, although maybe of tremendous wealth before the Civil War, did not have it after in most cases. But Duff Green has been a mansion that has survived the test of time. I think it's about time for breakfast, so let's go inside. The mansion has had many famous visitors from Confederate President Jefferson Davis to Commander and later President of the United States Ulysses S. Grant. All at different times, under very different occasions, Jefferson Davis, pre the end of the Civil War, Ulysses S. Grant, a guest of the home when it was being used as a hospital. He, likewise as Jefferson Davis, though, would dance in the Grand Ballroom here at the Duff Green. A great majority of the items that you see do date to the period. They have come from various means, estate sales uh, for the most part. As you start to see a lot of these antebellum homes sold over the years, the owners of the Duff Green made sure to purchase every item that they possibly could to add as much authenticity to this home as possible. One of the things that I found very interesting is that the iron on the porches, for instance, during the Civil War, Duff, the owner of the mansion, actually gave that to the Confederate cause to be melted down for bullets. Later, when they actually went to restore the porches, the Historical Society said, you can't do that, you can't alter the home. Well, the owner at that time was able to produce a picture that showed that indeed the house during the Civil War had had those porches and they were restored finding the actual pattern of iron still in existence at a Birmingham Alabama ironworks and they were able to restore the outside porches to their glory of the Civil War the Civil War footprint is still very much felt in Vicksburg for instance the town was taken after a 40 plus day siege on July the 4th and Vicksburg, Mississippi would not celebrate the 4th of July for over 80 years because of this. The previous owner's son, and he told me they didn't have indoor plumbing in this house before the war. He said downstairs they had a double-decker outhouse. Now I have to plead ignorance on that. I have no clue what a double-decker outhouse is. Uh, I don't, don't think I want to be on the first floor of the double-decker outhouse. <laughs> but, but, but they did have those at the term. I didn't do some research on that one. Clueless on that. But we do know that some of these families did have indoor plumbing in these homes before the war. There's ruins of an antebellum mansion about 25 miles south of here in Fort Gibson, Windsor. 
It was called Windsor Castle. Well, we know Windsor burned in the 1890s, but they had indoor plumbing before the war. They had water tanks on top of the house and they would collect rainwater and it would allow them to have a gravity fed plumbing system. Think about how strong that house would have to be to withstand the weight of water tanks up on the roof. And just to give an example of how ridiculously wealthy some of these families were, the family on Windsor in Port Gibson had their dry cleaning done in France. They shipped their silk gowns overseas to be dry cleaned. Now, not only do you have to be just stupidly wealthy to afford that, you really had to have two complete wardrobes because back then a transatlantic trip would take half a year. Well, if you didn't have indoor plumbing, there's old Revival there, a privy chair with a table pot in it. Now, if y'all haven't had a chance, you need to walk over and take a look because there's a picture in the bottom of this table pot. Come on, come on, take a look. It's nothing crude, it's a picture of a person. You see that dude in there? That's General Butler. General Butler was the Union commander in the war. So they were occupied during the war. Obviously not a popular guy, okay? <laughs> they hated his guts. Now, all the furnishings in this room were picked up in an estate sale in South Mississippi down in Wiggins. Uh, it was an old plantation home down there, and we went down there, and the boss got one of the big uh, Penske rental trucks from Home Depot. Now, the longer we were there, the more she bought, man. <laughs> we filled up this whole room. Now, this is known as a half-teaster bed. Now, you notice the plastic rings up there. Those would originally have been brass, and that was for hanging mosquito netting. Now, a lot of guests have asked about the size of the bed. Why in the world would you build a bed like that so high off the floor? I think it was really status more than anything else. You have to realize in the early 1800s, especially in the parts of America that was based primarily on agriculture, like the Southeast, unless you were one of these type of folks who had these big old mansions, your average people shared the same bed. In those days, you had to be pretty well off financially to have your own room with your own bed in it. Most families shared one bed. So to have your own room in your own bed said something about your finances. To have a bed like that just screamed, I got a whole lot of money and I don't mind spending it on a big old bed. I think really that's what it was, his status. And another thing about these homes, when you're in your bedrooms, you'll notice you almost never see a closet. There'll be an armoire in the corner, maybe two, okay? That was intentional as well. They left out closets because you were taxed by closets. Closets were considered an extra room in the house. So unless you just had to have a closet, you would leave it out completely and thus the need for the own bars, okay? And in some of the homes in the Southeast in those times, it, it was not unusual for you to be taxed by the number of inside steps you had in the house, but not outside steps. So you still have some examples of these old homes where you got a two or three story house, but the only access in between the floors is outside steps, not on the inside, because you were taxed by the inside. Now the light blue you can see on the underside of the porch, you'll see that throughout the South. If it's an old house and it's got a porch, 99 times out of 100, it's gonna be painted that shade of blue. Well, like I said, none of this stuff was done randomly. They used that shade of blue because it was believed in, and it was still believed now, because I've had a little old lady swear this to me. You paint it that shade of blue, and supposedly birds and bugs will think it's the sky, and they won't nest on it. Now, obviously, I can't tell you what the birds and the bugs are thinking, but I've never found a bird's nest up here or a wasp's nest up here. I seldom even find a spider web. I think it works. I don't know why, but I, I think it works. I lost about 1,700 men. Ran at one point tried to change the course of the Mississippi River. Tried to dig a new river channel where the river flow away from the city and he wouldn't have to take the city at all. It was a neat idea, but it, it didn't work out. He was finally able to take the city by coming in from the landward side. And right at the top of this hill, there's a road that goes to the left, Openwood Street. It swings straight around to Old Jackson Road, and that's the road Grant used to fight his way in. He fought his way in, surrounded the city, and laid siege to the town. Well, Pemberton held out as long as he could, I think, but after 40 plus days of siege, most of were starving to death. Well, he met with his staff on the 3rd of July, and the next day he met with Ulysses Grant and surrendered the city. But, you know, some of the old attitudes die really slow. Um, Tennessee Williams said one time that in the South, the past isn't dead. He said, hell, it's not even past. Um, I, and I tell you, uh, i give you an example. I had a high school classmate, because I grew up here in Vicksburg, a high school classmate. She wanted to take her grandmother and a great aunt to see Natchez, Mississippi, which is 75 miles south of here, and there's some beautiful land of home homes down here. Well, Grandma was indignant at the very idea. She said, we don't visit Natchez, Mississippi, darling, and we don't associate with people from Natchez. Natchez surrendered in a war without a fight. I'm thinking, yeah, 160 years ago. Jesus, wow. let it go. But there's two sides to this story. There's a historical side and what I like to call the baloney side, all right? The historical side is an actual doc doctor did put a real medical report into the medical journals at the time concerning this issue. It is known as the bullet pregnancy. Okay. Supposedly, there was a young lady who was walking through Vicksburg, okay? Now, this is during the time of the siege. 
So there's bullets flying and, you know, shells going off everywhere. Well, supposedly, supposedly, a soldier coming through town was shot <laughs> through the testicle. The bullet continued through his body, struck this young lady in the abdomen, and got her pregnant. Okay? Now, obviously, that's the baloney side of the story. But it is an actual fact that a real doctor did put that into the medical journals at the time. Now, the only thing I can think of is he had to be really good friends with this young lady's parents, and he was trying to do whatever he could to help preserve her reputation. But it is a fact that it was put into the medical journals at the time that this young lady was impregnated by a bullet that was shot to it other soldiers. So that was just a brief glimpse into the tour. It was really fantastic. I loved the history of the place. Our tour guide was excellent. He was funny and was completely knowledgeable about the property. And if you want to hear the whole thing, well, you're just going to have to come see it yourself, aren't you? So goodbye, Duff Green Mansion. We enjoyed it very much. Did you enjoy your time here? I did. I enjoyed it a lot. I'm sorry to just stick a camera in yeah. your face. I'm not very good with spontaneous stuff, but cool. Whatever. I think you're wonderful with spontaneous Hello, stuff. Hello, everyone. <laughs> very pretty place. Highly recommend it. And uh, not sure where I'll put this in the video either. Probably at the end, but... Uh, if I don't, stay tuned for a good video, and if this is the end, uh, thank you so much for watching.